Daniel McAdams and Daniel, good to see you. Good to see you, Dr. Paul. Good. There were a couple important meetings this past uh, week having to do with money and uh, a little bit of politicking. The Federal Reserve uh, had a secret meeting. They announced it because they're supposed to, but the secret meeting, what they talked about, that is secret. Mm. We won't get to know about that, uh, you know, because uh, we're not privileged people. Even the people on the banking committee won't know about it. But what was interesting is uh, immediately after the first secret meeting with the Fed uh, occurred, uh, Yellen rushed over to the White House to have another secret meeting with the president. Of course, this the Fed is not political, you know, so, but she just had a little chat about family things. And uh, then shortly thereafter, there was another major Fed, uh, uh, Fed, Fed meeting. So uh, I imagine you saw that. What, what crossed your mind when you saw all this happening? Well, the first thing I thought is I want to ask Dr. Paul what he thinks went on in these meetings. <laughs> well, I, what, the first thing that came to my mind was what's the motivation behind this? Yeah, what, be, what goes on, they're, they're, they're admitting the truth. They know what we know, and they're dealing with, with the problem. But um, to me, it's this pretense that everything is okay. All the statistics are okay. They can't find anything wrong. Uh, but we better not raise interest rates yet uh, because the Europe, you know, European markets are still weak. But I think for them to do this much, they are a lot more concerned than they're letting uh, letting us to believe, and and so I think this is a very significant meeting uh, that they had. But uh, eventually they'll uh, they'll not be able to come up with anything other than propping up the markets. And maybe the meeting did have some significance because the last several days the market has popped up again, and evidently Wall Street was reassured. But the question what we raised is, uh, you know, what are they going to do about Main Street? But Yellen, in her public announcement, oh, she's all for Main Street. We have to concentrate on Main Street and jobs and taking care of people. And uh, I was I was kidding a little bit with you. I said, well, maybe maybe the Fed has become populist too. <laughs> Everybody has to talk about Main Street now and shy away from Wall Street. So uh, there's a little bit of that going on. But quite frankly, they're not going to change their policy. I do not see how it's going to be uh, any boost uh, to Main Street because our problems are structural and they're not going to be temporarily helped by manipulating interest rates as uh, it, it does for Wall Street. And our interest was really piqued by a, a piece on Zero Hedge this morning that outlined the sort of shift in Yellen's rhetoric toward, I guess you'd say, a more popular streak. But she said, um, we are focused on plentiful jobs and stable prices. You know, wow. We're for the common man. You know, trying to dispel this idea that these are the banksters in secret meetings. <laughs> I wonder if uh, she ever considered free markets and sound money. That might be a good jobs program. To, I would like to get a chart up here because uh, Hedge had had a chart of the various things to sort of disprove this rosy scenario. Everything is going well uh, for the country and they don't have to worry about things. But uh, if we could take a look at that uh, chart and show that these uh, various things have been going down and not, not improving. So uh, I don't know. Uh, here we go. Uh, if we take a look at this, this is, um, this is significant. He has nine, nine things there and the direction of what's happening. And uh, they ought to be concerned. They ought to be concerned about Main Street. They ought to be concerned about world economies and the dollar and everything else. But uh, here we take a look at student loans skyrocketing. And right now, Obama's setting the stage for allowing a declaration that they don't have to pay them off. I think 40% are not paying uh, paying their loans off, and uh, that's that's a big deal. I mean, that's uh, another trillion dollars or so that's uh, out there. And w once they exempt thirty or forty or fifty percent, why would the rest of them pay anything? Yeah. They're going they're going to quit paying. But uh, you know, it's a uh, a, a wonderful employment uh, uh, you know uh, economy right now. They're always claiming that unemployment. I think we wanted to keep that uh, chart up for a little bit longer. Uh, the the employment is actually down, uh, they claim, but but t take a look at the people on food stamps. That is up. Uh, has, has it done any good for the federal debt? It's still skyrocketing as usual. But, well, everything's being held together for Wall Street with the money printing. Look at the chart on money printing. Straight up. And uh, Obamacare hasn't solved the problem of quality care. The middle class hasn't done too well with that, and the poor haven't done too well, but the costs are skyrocketing. 
But here's the important figure on the labor participation force. So if you don't count a lot of people, you sort of uh, fudge these figures and hide some of the real problems. Uh, inequality in the economy, uh, uh, minority uh, are not gaining any, and, and we do know that minorities do quite well prior to the time we had minimum wage laws. And then uh, medium income, that's down. So where's all this money going? They're printing this money, they're spending the money, and interest rates are low. Uh, no economic growth, medium income is down. And uh, one consequence has been that uh, even with essentially hardly any interest rate to pay on a mortgage, uh, housing ownership is straight down. So I don't know where anybody can get satisfaction with what is going on um, by looking at the stock market. It looks like, it looks like Wall Street's doing pretty well. Well, I'm no financial expert. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm less than a novice. But it doesn't take a genius to look at those two, two of those charts, juxtapose the money printing with median family income, and how can you look at those together and say that they're for Main Street and not Wall Street? Where's, as you said, where's the money going? There's tons more of it, but less of it's getting into the house of the, of the Main Street people. Yeah, and, and you know, usually they talk about the stock market and S&P, and one of the charts will have the S&P on there, but a lot of money goes into bonds, and uh, when there's no interest, that means the, the price of the bond is very, very high. You're paying a lot uh, to invest your money for no interest. So they're very, very expensive. So a lot of money went into bonds, propping up debt and propping up corporate debt, community debt, government debt, international debt. So they say, well, you know, the Krugmans of the world, there's no bubble. There's no bubble. Uh, uh, monetary policy doesn't create the bubble. Well, of course, we had a few. We had a NASDAQ bubble and a housing bubble, and now we have a bond bubble. And, and the whole system is a bubble in, in many ways because uh, uh, people make mistakes when they don't know what the real interest rates are. So this uh, get, getting the truth out is the, is the big problem. But so far, uh, the management by the Fed seems to accommodate at least give enough reassurance on the very short run. I think the, the short run is getting shorter and shorter because it used to be that have shifts in policy and it would last for four, five, six years and there'd be a correction. But right now, I think it's very short. Things go down sharply and things pop up again. But uh, I think the middle class, I think Main Street, they're not messing around with this. They've been stung so many times. Uh -huh. So all that money doesn't benefit Main Street, especially since people don't feel comfortable about starting new businesses uh, b because of the system and the tax system and, and all these other problems we have. So the money has to go somewhere, and it goes into those individuals who are allow allowed to speculate on Wall Street, and there are still many making billions of dollars and hedge funds. All these things seem to do well in a period where uh, endless printing of money uh, serves a special section of the economy. Well, thanks to Zero Hedge, we have a second chart, and I think that second chart demonstrates even more poignantly the real divide between Wall Street and Main Street. And maybe yeah, let's see if we can take, 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 take a look at that, because, uh, yeah, there, now this is very, very clear. Um, you, know, you see the, the line uh, is moving upward, uh, that is Wall Street, and I think that's measured by uh, S&P. Uh, and then if you look at the blue line that comes over and the arrow pointing down, uh, that's the uh, uh, labor participation rate. And that's, that's down in the low 60s right now. But there's a tremendous change on that. So when the people leave the labor force, uh, then they're not calculated as being unemployed. Uh, so it's not a healthy economy. That should be, if you had a healthy grown economy, that line would uh, be what was occurring between 78 up until 99. The interesting thing about this chart, uh, uh, Daniel, is the fact that I work on the theory that our major economic change has occurred at the turn of the century uh, when the NASDAQ bubble burst. And this one sort of points it out. Something dramatic happened in 99. And I think that's when the old-fashioned rules that the Keynesians were getting away with. You know, we can manage this economy. Uh, we raise interest rates when the economy looks like it's overheating. And we lower them when they need a little bit of stimulus. And it seems to work. But I think that's all over with. And I think that now they have no control. And that probably represents one of the reasons why they're sort of panicking behind the scenes. Uh, it would be fascinating if had a had a, maybe the NSA will give us the recording of what they're, <laughs> they're talking about. In there. But I'll bet they were very concerned about what's going on around the world and in, in the monetary system and what are they going to do, you know, when uh, when things uh, where we lose lose control. And I think that's what they're anticipating. 
And one of the things you mentioned before the show, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you point out 99 as the, as the date when really the, the rules completely changed. Uh, but you, I, I also, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you pointed out 1987 as sort of the beginning of that change, as a significant date where they started realizing they needed to start changing the rules. Yeah. The, the, the big financial event in, uh, in my transition from only delivering babies to getting involved in speaking out on economic issues, of course, was 1971 with the severing of the dollar from gold and believing that was going to lead us into an age of chaos. And uh, it hasn't gone as fast as some of us believe, but it's there. The chaos is there. But the second one is 1987. I remember, remember it very clearly because they talk about the one day, I, I think it was the 19th of October in 87, it went, it went down 22%. That was the most in one day ever. Still is the history of it. And it went down over 500 points and the stock market was only uh, like in the, in the 2,500 range. So uh, it was a big percentage. But if you go back and look at the whole week or two in there, it, it went down a thousand points. So it was a big deal. So they even had temporary closure of the markers. Uh, they were just uh, really frightened by this. But the sad part of this is that uh, the individual who came to the rescue in the sense of how do we, how do we you know, calm this down a bit, uh, has been uh, was our president, President Reagan. You say, well, why would you complain about that? He's calmed it down, and uh, we have this president's working group on financial markets. They get together when there are problems, and they patch it up, and they keep things going. Well, they just make the bubble uh, bigger. And uh, the nickname for uh, for the president's working group on financial markets is, is the plunge protection team. Mm -hmm. Who's it designed for? To protect the owner of their property and household owners who are going to lose their jobs and lose their houses. It's strictly to protect Wall Street and prop up Wall Street. And they've been pretty successful on this. But uh, in, but since it's topped out back then, it was in a couple thousands, going up all the way to eighteen thousand. But it's uh, it's wavering up there, and they uh, pumped a lot of money in here. And so this year is is very maybe a telltale year on whether they'll get, be able to get regenerate uh, more falsehoods where people will will be reassured. But uh, that that was that was a very big uh, a very big event. But the, 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 one of the reasons why I was discouraged by it was uh, President Reagan was a free market guy. He probably didn't get so much in these decisions. He probably said, hey, there's a, well, things are on a bar. You've got to do something. So he signs the executive order. And uh, they have a group of four, four key individuals. They are powerful when it comes to manipulating short-term economic condition. The president of the Fed. You know, uh, the uh, SEC chairman, the uh, Community Futures, uh, Com Commodity Futures Trading Commission is up there, as well as Treasury. The kingpin there is the Fed chairman. That's why the whole committee probably didn't go over to, uh, to, Ray, uh, to, uh, to uh, see Obama. Uh, of course, that whole committee didn't attend the uh, Fed, Fed meeting. Who knows? Maybe they did, since it was totally secret. But believe me, that group has a lot of authority, even under the so-called law and their interpretation, that they get involved in markets. You know, if, if their purpose is to stop the market from plunging and getting out of control, what do they have to do? They have to buy something. So the markets are out there anticipating, what's the government going to do? They're not anticipating uh, economic factors and what about investments and these things. They anticipate, what's the Fed going to say? Even if they agree with the disastrous policy and things are going to end badly, on the short run, today, tomorrow, and the next day, if the Fed says something, oh, if they say that, the markets are going to go up. So they go in and they speculate and buy it, and maybe next week they'll want to sell off. Eventually they'll lose total control. They don't have much control right now. So you have this uh, financial working group, uh, and I'm sure they're into the uh, commodities business and futures business, and, and, they can, and they can buy and sell. Actually, they were authorized uh, uh, in the 1930s where our treasury could get involved in manipulating gold prices mm -hmm. back then. That's where they used to play games. And we were even on a gold standard then that was suspended, of course, by... Uh, uh, FDR, but uh, this they are very, very powerful people, but eventually they're going to be very, very weak people and they'll be totally discredited. I think central banking is in the transition of being discredited around the world. And of course, that's why we're seeing 
uh, financial and political chaos in Europe, and you see the bankruptcies, and we're very much involved. I think the only thing that holds it together for us and them, them being Europe, and uh, how to, who's going to bail it out, and the banks are in hawk with uh, sovereign debt and Greek uh, things, but they seem to smooth that over, but we're very much involved. As long as the world puts a trust in our dollar, uh, and they will participate in maintaining that trust, because everybody realizes if the dollar goes bust quickly, they're going to lose a whole lot. So it's in their interest to make sure the dollar doesn't do that. So the traders say, yeah, they're going to do it. They'll keep it together. Maybe I'll have time to get out when the time mm. comes. But but uh, this has never been done before. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the history shows that zero interest rates or negative rate has never happened in 5,000 years. Mm-hmm. It's so absurd. It's so removed. You know, even biblically, uh, they recognize paying interest, you know, and fair, uh, you know, honest weights and measures. And if you loan money, that the interest is a legitimate thing, this sort of thing. But uh, this this is coming. This is so bizarre and it's so worldwide. And it's a paper currency that is all around. So I think what we're doing is smelling a little bit of their concern. And I wouldn't be surprised if we hear of more meetings like this. You know, I, we always like to look for the bright side, and so I, uh, <laughs> I found an area that I think you'll agree with Janet Yellen, uh, and this was in the Zero Hedge article. I think it was quoting a Time Magazine profile, but uh, it said that Yellen admits that there are many things about the economy she just doesn't know, <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't understand. And she said, the traditional relationship between job creation and inflation seems to have, uh, have come apart. <laughs> yeah, that uh, was the old saying of the Phillips curve, you know, if you inflated, uh, you got more jobs. But if you stopped inflating, you know, you'd ruin it. But uh, and then finally, they in the 70s, they f- found this term stagflation. Oh, you mean you can have a weak economy and prices still go up? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Look at the when, at the end stages. That's what happens. That's the Zimbabwe model. You know, uh, prices are going up, but the economy keeps going down. And I think we're having a, f- a fair amount of that right now. But the whole notion when she says, uh, there are just a lot of things I just don't know, <laughs> your reaction would be, well, then don't try to fix them. Or hers yeah. would be, we've got to keep trying things. She said, yeah. the problem is that the global economy is playing by new rules. So <laughs> it's always someone else's fault. It's never the fact that they're doing it in the first place. It's maybe like the they, neocons. Maybe they're playing the old rules of the economy, and she's bewildered by that. Of course, she can't know. I mean, this whole idea. But she's been conditioned and trained over many, many decades. They, they can know, and they know what a proper rate is. Uh, of interest and it's totally absurd uh, and, and I just hope that the people understand where the problem uh, you know where the problem was when this thing whole comes down but I think there's a lot more information like that see I sort of is in spite of the way we're doing right now uh, politically and all I think we're making some progress with Austrian economic teaching because there's a lot of people who know there's something very suspicious about the Federal Reserve. Of course, that's something I've talked about for a long time, the Federal Reserve. If anybody wants a sound economy, they have to deal with monetary policy and they have to reject some of these falsehoods that if you create money, you're creating wealth. That is just just not true. It's just so false. And that debt doesn't matter. Debt does matter. So uh, you ha- and, and there's a limit to it and it always gets liquidated. And that is what the big fight is right now, is how is the debt going to be liquidated? The the, uh, Fed is praying every night that if we can just liquidate debt at a 2% rate, we'll all be okay. But they have no control over that. And I think, uh, as Daniel points out, Yellen probably doesn't quite realize that. She doesn't have control. Uh, They don't. They always told me when I'd quiz them, they said, well, it's okay. We understand what you're talking about. But as long as it's orderly, as long as it's systematic and slow and steady, we don't want these panics. And, of course, that's what the plunge protection team is there for, is to prevent the panic. But if you prevent the panic and prevent the correction, all you're doing is building bigger distortion that will cause the ultimate panic and the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, escape from the dollar, and then it's going to be much more catastrophic. That is what we're facing. I think these recent meetings are indicating that they are very, very, very concerned. I think they're up against the wall and they really probably don't know exactly what to do. So um, they'll be calling us soon, I'm sure, and asking our advice. And I will tell them, why don't you just disband not only the working group on financial markets, 
Why don't you people defend? Just disband yourself. Just leave. Let the market handle this. Right now, there's a lot of private entities loaning money outside of the banking system because it, because it wouldn't be that bad. We, we could adapt uh, pretty easily. But it might be that uh, the, the system they adapt, they might, they might want to, in order to restore confidence, they might say that if we're going to extend credit, we want to be guaranteed that it's backed up by something like a commodity and not by the promises of the politicians that they won't spend money uh, and run up debt and expect the Fed to monetize this. So we're, in, we're living in exciting times. 